Length the night per renate. Why exactly that? I will explain later. First of all, what's the plan for this video? Convert ammonium perenate into perenic acid. For that, we need to build a column ourselves and then convert the respective lanthanide oxide with perenic acid to the corresponding perenate. Let it crystallize and then determine the crystal structure via XRD. So let's go. For chemicals, we need ammonium perenate, a cation exchanger, holmium oxide, erbium oxide, thulium oxide and distilled water. Just the oxides of holmium and erbium alone are so beautifully pink. First of all, I have to weigh the right amount of ammonium perenate. It needs to be 5.7 milligrams of ammonium perenate, equivalent to 0.021 millimole. A weird number, I know, but smart people have thought about it and I will explain that in another video. The great thing about perenates is that they are extremely dense. This means it's a pain to weigh them out to the 0.x milligram accuracy. At this point, you're exchanging one gram for another. Pain. Ammonium perenate has an extremely high molar mass due to the 5D metals and its salt often have high densities. I will do this seven times because I want to have a supply of perinic acid for the future, from which other perinates can be made. But I wanted to show what pain it is to weigh out 5D salts. Here's the weighing of the respective lanthanide oxide. Now the weighted amount is dissolved in 200 microliters of water. And since we want to make perinic acid from the ammonium perinate, we need to replace the ammonium cation with the H plus cation. We do this with an cation exchanger. It's some acid residue bound to a resin that binds a cation from a salt and replaces it with a proton in this case. So in the form of our ammonium perenate solution, the ammonium ion goes into the acid group of the resin and a proton is released into the solution and there the perenic acid can be formed while the ammonium ions are firmly bound to the ion exchanger. Now I have to briefly talk about the perenic acid again. I wrote HREO4 here. That only halfway reflects the reality. Perenic acid is actually an interesting metal oxide compound with a structure where water is coordinated to one of the two rhenium atoms. So what I'm making in the video is actually better described as dirhenium heptoxide dihydrate with the formula Re2O7 H2O twice, you can actually get real HREO4 in the gas phase, but to keep the video a bit simpler and the graphics nicer, I will use this formula to describe the pyridic acid, but from now on, you know, this is a simplified representation. It should be noted that the pKa value of pyridic acid is minus 1.25, classifying it as a strong acid. It is the strongest peroxy acid of the seventh group, stronger than permanganese and pertechnetic acid. To build the column, the head of a plastic pipette was cut off and a part of the tip was cut off at the bottom. Teflon was painstakingly inserted at the bottom to keep the ion exchanger beads in the column. Now the ion exchanger is filled into the syringe and now it's the important step. Check if only clear liquid comes out from the bottom or if the resin comes out. If the resin comes out, discard and start again. The ion exchanger should be fully saturated with H plus ions so that it can do its job well later on. For this, it is loaded with water. So water can act as an acid and saturate the acid groups with protons. Since the column is so small and the surface tension of water is so high, the air underneath has to be evacuated so that the water can even get to the ion exchanger. Once that's done, the actual reaction can start. 200 microliters of the ammonium perenate solution is now added to the column. The Appendorf tube is rinsed with another 200 microliters and also added to the column. In total, the perenic acid should be present in around 500 microliters of water. Now pull out the air again and then add the last 100 microliters of water and pull out the air yet again. Of course, a different attachment is used for distilled water and possible ammonium perenate solution. And now let the ion exchanger do its thing. The ammonium ions are exchanged for protons and fresh perenic acid should drip into the new Appendorf tube. How do we test for acids? With pH paper. The pH paper shows no longer acidity, which means that all of the acid is in the Appendorf tube. This is what it would look like if there were still some perenic acid in the last drop. So what do we do in this case? We just add more water and once again pass it through and we will take a tiny sample and check if the acid is now out of the column. And there you go.
we have pyrenic acid. What we are doing now is something that you might already be familiar with from high school on the topic of acid and bases, a neutralization. The lanthanide oxide is a base and it's added to the pyrenic acid. By using an oxide, only water is produced as a byproduct of the lanthanide pyrenate. Since the oxide dissolved poorly in acid, we assist it with heating. After one to three days, the oxide is dissolved as much as possible. Then the solution is placed on a slide to crystallize over several weeks. Weeks. We can test if the reaction is complete since I took an excess of the oxide and all the acid should have been reacted. That means there is no acid and how do we measure the absence of acid? Also with pH paper, it should indicate a neutral to alkaline pH. Aren't those beautiful crystals? Unfortunately, the argument, yeah, it has the right color, it must be the right one, isn't complete enough in science. But for now, I will be quiet and let's enjoy some beautiful microscope images. The attentive among you may have noticed that I now included presidymium and neodymium and erbium was missing. Here's a picture of the erbium. Unfortunately, it hasn't crystallized by the day of measurement and the presidymium actually had the research background that we really wanted to determine the crystal structure with the XRD because no one has done that before us. So how does a measurement work? The crystal unfortunately have to be destroyed and then after a long search, when a perfect clear crystal was found, it gets picked with this tool. The needle with the crystal was handed over to the professor who inserted it into the measurement device. The crystal is rotated about all axes during the measurement in a 100 Kelvin cold nitrogen stream and must of course and of course must also be positioned in a way that it always remains in the x-ray beam. After a short test run you can then check if the picked crystal is suitable for the measurement. For this you look at the distance of the reflections and then you look how big the ring is that encompasses the furthest reflection. There's a number in angstrom below and it should be as small as possible. It is small when the ring is large. It's a bit confusing work. If the crystal is suitable, as it is here, the actual measurement can begin and during the measurement time, which in this case was one hour, you will see something like this on the screen. Then the crystal can be removed from the device by the professor and returned so that the next crystal can be picked with the tool and then be measured again. If everything went well, you will get great crystal structures like these. So the green is the lanthanide, in this case it's holmium 3 plus, the red are oxygen atoms and the blue is the rhenium atom. Hydrogen atoms are not shown here, but you can clearly see how two water molecules of the dihydrate are coordinated to the holmium. In the program Mercury, which I'm using, you can also display the packing. With erbium, you can see very well that this is a dihydrate. Since it didn't crystallize for me, I simply took the data from the ICSD, our go-to database for inorganic crystal structures. Last but not least, the thulium perinate. Here the hydrogen atoms are now labeled so that you can actually see that this is a tetrahydrate. Bonus, for the crystal structure we also took a UV vis. Since only the presidymium and the neodymium perinate were colorful upon mere observation, but I wanted to have some colorful complexes for the video, we also used the UV vis device which also detects color absorption that we cannot see with the naked eye. And here we can really see the great absorption of holmium 3 plus ions.
Thulium is a bit less spectacular, but here too we can see a match with the literature. The absorption peak in the red area here again proves the green color impression that dissolved Thulium 3 plus ions create. Now it should be noted that a normal UV vis, in this case I can even cut it down to just vis, only tells you that the lanthanide ion is in there. A solid state UV vis recording such as here from the Thulium would provide even better evidence that the lanthanide is indeed incorporated into the crystal structure. So lanthanide perinates, why do something like this? Because the ultimate goal here is to work with technetium and with a glance at the periodic table you can see why rhenium. Rhenium is extremely similar to technetium, especially due to the lanthanide contraction which occurs between the 4D and the 5D elements. A quick aside, the lanthanide contraction describes a phenomenon where the ionic radius decreases within the F block despite having the same charge. This phenomena affects the subsequent elements so that the technetium has the atomic radius of 135 picometers just like rhenium even though there is a whole period with 32 electrons between them and that's why perinates and why specifically holmium, erbium and thulium honestly simply because they are conveniently located next to each other they all have nice colors and their oxides are easy to weigh. We only showed prosodymium because it has some research value but since it's in the form of a mixed valence oxide PR6O11 with the prosodymium 4 plus which requires more thought and I just wanted to keep the video simple. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.